walk the smile and bear the load. I will hold a Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to. of grace through God above. I will build you, I'll believe you, I will never tear you down. I'll be there whenever you need me with God's blessing as a crown. share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony. Born of all we've known together, of Christ's love for you. If you have your Bible, you can open it with me to the book of Daniel. We'll be reading there in just a moment. Uh, last week, uh, my kiddos were trying to get us out of chapter one. We didn't quite make it. This week, uh, uh, our secretary is trying to get me out of chapter one. I'm you know, beginning to think that y'all might not like the pace that I'm preaching at here. But we are in Daniel chapter one, going to finish chapter one today, so uh, turn with me there. Daniel chapter 1. Now, if we, as we have looked through the text, as we've studied it so far, we have seen that God looked after and watched over Daniel and his companions in many powerful ways. We see that they had come through a lot. We, we uh, studied and looked at how they had gone through a, a, some terrible turmoil in the nation and they saw their uh, nation defeated, they saw their capital besieged, and they saw their temple destroyed. Uh, we looked into how these young men were taken captive and forced into service as eunuchs, and how they were entered into a three-year three course uh, of deception designed to turn them away from everything that they had known up to that point in their life. God uh, was with them, Daniel and Ananiah and Mishael and Azariah, through all of these things, and, and, and God brought Daniel into special favor with the right people at, at the right time, as, as we saw earlier in our study, so that he might be able to stand up successfully for his faith and remain undefiled by abstaining from that food which had been offered to idols. God gave him that opportunity, gave him the resources he needed, gave him the favor that he required with those that he needed it with, and he did stand up for what he believed in. And today we'll see, our text will show, that God rewarded this faithfulness, the faithfulness of Daniel and also of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And I believe, beloved, that he will do the same for us when we're faithful to him. Let's look at our text. Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill 
in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the wisdom it contains. We thank you for our opportunity to be here, to hear it read, to be in your presence and among your people. And Father, I ask that you would bless my efforts to preach your word. Lord, we ask that you would guide us in your truth. Help us, Lord, to hide your truth in our hearts that we might not sin against you, Father, rather that we might shine a bright light for the gospel in a world that so desperately needs to hear it. We pray, Lord, that we would look to the examples in scripture, specifically that of Daniel and his companions, so that we might be encouraged to look for those opportunities you provide to stand up for what we believe and take advantage of the blessings that you give for those who are faithful. We thank you for these things. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So we, he we see here in our text God's plan and faith's reward. Now what we see is that regarding these four children, and recall the text in, in chapter 1 refers to Daniel and his companions as children each time because they were. They were young. Remember, they were around probably 15, 16 years old when they were taken into captivity. And then they grew into young adulthood in the three years that they spent in this indoctrination course that had been established uh, in the court of the eunuchs who were servants to Nebuchadnezzar. And these four children, though they were impressionable as children usually are, though they were isolated as, as sometimes children can be, especially in the world in which we live in today, uh, I, I think probably children are now, uh, especially teenagers, more isolated than they've ever been by virtue of these digital prisons that they carry around everywhere they go. And so it, it blesses my heart to see kids interact with one another as human interaction is intended. And, and it, it disturbs me when uh, over the years as I've seen children isolate themselves from one another even on the same in the same vehicle. I've, I've have seen on church trips and school trips a kid on this side of the bus texting a kid on this side of the bus and they're sitting right across from one another. And so, and, and so you see they are isolated and being isolated is is one of the ways that we become open to suggestion. Nebuchadnezzar knew this and so he isolated these children so that they could suggest to them that their beliefs were not valid, were not reasonable, were not effective, and replace those beliefs with a Babylonian worldview. And so into this, God gives these children, it says, knowledge and skill. And the text makes clear that the knowledge and the skill that these young men obtained was from God, not from man. And, and so you think about what hap had to happen in a miraculous way. Here are four children growing into young men that are in a, a school of a sort where they are being taught by the Chaldeans who are the cream of the crop of the Babylonian Empire. They're the elite. And they are being taught, they are being indoctrinated, they are being 
uh, exposed to what we might call Babylonian propaganda, and they're being prepared to serve Nebuchadnezzar. But God intervenes, and while all this is going on around them, God gives them wisdom. It says, God gave them knowledge and skill. And so what, what we see here is that regardless of circumstances, when someone is faithful to God, God will draw close to them. Just like the scripture says, if you draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. And so these four young men had gotten as close to God as possibly they, they or as probably as close as they possibly could, and then everything they went through as believers drew them closer to God because even though they went through so many terrible trials, God sustained them. And you and I both know that our spiritual maturity increases as we see God at work, especially in the times of adversity in our lives. And so these young men were maturing in their faith, they were serving God, and God gave to them knowledge and skill. So this indoctrination effort by the Babylonians was intended to turn Daniel and his companions away from everything they knew and believed in Judah to what they, the Babylonians wanted them to know and believe in Babylon. And recall, they, they even took from them their names, each of which acknowledged God in a very special way, and gave them new names that acknowledged false demonic gods in an effort to one-up the names that they had been born with. So everything that was done to them was done to turn them away from all they knew to be true, and these efforts completely failed. Rather, God steps in and implements his plan. And beloved, I want to encourage you today to hold on to that truth. That as long as we are faithful to God, nothing can disrupt his plan for us. Now that doesn't mean that his plan is going to, to, to be what the world would consider good. Because we know that God works through adversity. He works through difficult trials and circumstances that we would prefer not to undergo. But he works in those things so that we might see and the world around us might see that the faithfulness of a Christian who is serving God as best they know how cannot be derailed by anything they face. You think about the spiritual greats that are contained in scripture. You think about those who have laid down their, their life for what they believe. If you've never read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I encourage you to read it. Now, it's, it's a difficult read. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a very difficult read, but it, it's a historical survey of many who laid their life down for their faith and their trust in the Lord. And it's a testimony to how God used their sacrifice to further his kingdom. And so when we think about how God can use us and bless us, we need to recognize that sometimes God uses and blesses his children in the midst of persecution, in the midst of terrible trials and difficult circumstances, but even those around them recognize what God is doing. Our first example was the uh, Prince of the Eunuchs. We'll go back to a couple of weeks to our study with, with regard to him. Even though Daniel and his companions had been through so much, the Prince of the Eunuchs recognized that there was something special about these children and recognized that, that God had his hand upon them, maybe not consciously but subconsciously he knew and that's how God was able to bring Daniel into favor with this prince of the eunuchs and the second person we see was was that that Melzar or steward of the prince of the eunuchs and how he was able to convince this man to risk his his life and limb for their their dietary requirements 
Again, another miraculous event in which God worked through these children, these young men, in such a way that even those who did not believe benefited by observing and experiencing the power of God. And when we are faithful, we can expect God to do the same thing in the lives of those around us. Now, maybe not in as dramatic a way as what we're reading in Scripture, but the effect is the same. When, when we as Christians get a bit of bad news, maybe we hear that our employer is downsizing and we've lost our, our livelihood as a result. Now the temptation would be there to really let that get us down, maybe even get angry, maybe uh, lash out verbally against the, the, the mismanagement of the economy or the, or the company that led to uh, our, the necessity of, of letting so many people go from a company. And, and, and there's a lot of people who are going through that situation, have gone through it in the past and will go through it in the future. But as, if we as Christians receive that that bad news or any other bad news in faith and look, as, look at it as an opportunity to, to trust God and make our faith in Him known, people will take note of that. Because people watch Christians and they expect us to react according to what we believe. And so we must stand up for our faith when we have that opportunity, even if it's in the midst of a circumstance or a situation we'd rather not be in. And when you look at Daniel and his companions, it's safe to say that they were in several situations in succession that they would had rather not been in. But with each challenge they face, they were able to rely on God and they were able to strengthen their testimony and those around them were able to see that what God was doing in their life was powerful and it was a blessing to them in the midst of everything that they had to deal with. So there were resources that were being made available to Daniel and his companions. We know that for a fact. Uh, they were being fed, but their, their dietary requirements and needs, according to their faith, had been changed. So they, they were being cared for of, in, a, in a matter of speaking there in uh, Babylon. Um, Babylon. And, and we know the history books tell us that uh, the Chaldeans were known for their magi, for their wise men, for their astrologers, their soothsayers. So there was a lot probably in the form of literature and libraries and scrolls and that sort of thing that, that, they, that Daniel and his companions had access to. A lot of this was being presented by Babylon, but this knowledge was, be, was being given by God. So we can, it's safe to assume that what was presented by men, God was able to glean from that what was good and give to those who were faithful to him. You know, we have a, a saying for that, you know, when, when, we're, when we're, I guess, ruminating or, or digesting information around here, you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones. And that's probably what was going on here. God had given Daniel and his companions discernment so that they could see the good, glean from that knowledge what they needed, and that they could cast aside that which was of no use or uh, being false or, or being deceptive. And now there were skills. We know that uh, Babylon was a, an empire on the move and that they were growing at this time and uh, th that they were effective with uh, what would have then been modern uh, methods of, of warfare and engineering. Uh, the, uh, one of the great wonders of the ancient world were the hanging gardens of Babylon. And, and to this day, uh, the legend of those gardens remains, although our understanding of how they were able to create what has been described escapes even modern uh, scholars and engineers. So there were, there were skills present there that we can't really understand now because it, it, we, we can't really figure out how these ancient people were able to do these somewhat modern things. 
And so there, was, there were skills there. These skills were taught by men, but we have to recall and understand that skills, wherever, whatever they are, in whatever form or fashion, wherever they come from, are ultimately enabled by God. So what are you saying, preacher, that good things can come out of bad situations? Well, I'm not saying it. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Wouldn't you say that, there, that the, the situation and the circumstance of Daniel and his companion was infirmed? I would say. And it says, For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. I would imagine these young men probably experienced that as well. Just confused about their situation. But it says, The Spirit maketh, or excuse me, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches, excuse me, searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And then it says this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know, I, one thing about the Bible that you would imagine would never be in dispute is the meaning of the word all. And there are commentators who will tell you that sometimes the word all means some. I don't need to say anything further on that. Because when the word of God says all, it means all. So am I saying that good things can come out of bad situations? Yes. In fact, the Bible goes one step further, and it says, all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. All things. And that is a very difficult truth when you're going through difficult trials and circumstances and situations. But it's a truth that we can hold on to. Because when we're confused, and, and, and the text in Romans makes it clear that sometimes Christians are so confused, we don't even know how to pray or what we should pray for. It makes clear that that's going to happen. And we look at Daniel and his companions, and we could see that that was probably the situation that they were in. How do you pray? What do you pray for? What do you ask God for when you've been subject to the defeat of your nation, the destruction of, of your temple, your freedoms taken away, your beliefs assaulted with propaganda and deception and lies, your, even your very name taken from you and, and replaced with a name that is anathema or accursed because of its meaning to you. And then you're not given the freedom to eat things Rather, you're given that which would defile you because it was offered to a false demonic God before it was set before you on the table at which you dined. And the list goes on and on and on. Can you imagine how a 15-year-old, 16-year-old would be confused and wondering just what God's plan for them was? Absolutely, because put any of us in that situation, we may not make it out of it. But even when we're confused, God's still at work. He's working these things together for our good, even if we can't see that good from our perspective. Even if we don't see that good, this side of heaven, ultimately God is working it to our good. You, you look at the life of so many missionaries who faced so much adversity and had so little success but were so faithful for so many years. You all, all of you probably know, I've, I've mentioned before, my favorite, Adoniram Judson. Forty years on the mission field, seven converts. 
At one point so immersed in the translation of the New Testament into the Burmese language, he basically forgot how to speak English. Lost his health, lost uh, at least one of his children, ultimately died in, on the mission field and left, he had been imprisoned, he had been through all these things, <laughs> only seven converts. But today, in that country, there are thousands upon thousands of believers. He, did, he didn't see the good that God wrought this side of glory, but the good was accomplished because he loved God and lived according to the call and the purpose that God had placed on his life, and that is the responsibility that we have. Our text tells us that God worked all this knowledge and skill that these young men were exposed to, to the advantage of Daniel and his companions, so that they could grow in learning and wisdom. And this was the reward of their faith according to God's plan. And beloved, his plan has not changed. He still rewards our faith. Just like Daniel, we will see turmoil, tragedy, adversity, deception. But when we see these things, we can count on God to give us patience and perseverance, strength, discernment, and just like Daniel and his companions, learning and wisdom, which comes to us on our journey to spiritual maturity. Now, there are, there are those who, who tell you that you can become a spiritually mature person in 12 easy steps or less for a low, low payment or fill in the blank of whatever internet commercial happens to pop up on the YouTube that you're watching or whatever, whatever uh, social media platform you're engaging with. But we all know that that's not true. The world knows that that's not true. How does a person become a mature individual? Well, they live and they experience life, the ups and the downs, and hopefully learn from life what it has to teach. Well, the same is true, even more true, in our spiritual journey. We do not become spiritual giants in a matter of moments, months, or even years. It takes a lifetime to go from a spiritual babe to a spiritual giant. But God gives us a path to reach our potential, whatever it is. And the beautiful thing about our faith is that what, whatever it is God intends us to reach on the level of spiritual maturity, that's all, our, that's all we're responsible for. And what I mean by that is, God knows to what degree each of us have the potential to serve him and his kingdom and influence others for the good of the gospel and their own spiritual maturity, their own spiritual journey, their own, their own path that each one of them are on. All that remains for us to do is discover what that is. And it's not something you have to go out looking for. If you are faithful, the opportunities will present themselves. God will give you the wisdom that you need and you will be successful in that which God has called you to do, which is what we see in our text. And beloved, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How he worked in and through Daniel and his companions, he will work in and through us. And what we see is that when God gives us wisdom, we can count on it. And, and if any of us lack wisdom, God's word says in, in, in the epistle of James, ask, and he will give the wisdom that you need to you. Now, if God gives you the wisdom you need, 
what, what could you possibly lack? Just one thing. The conviction to live it out. God does not withhold wisdom. But sometimes we hold on to wisdom and we don't apply it to our lives. So if God promises in his word to give us the wisdom that we need, and he does, then it simply remains for us to act on those things which we know to be spiritually true and wise because God has revealed them to us so that we might do those things that we are called to do according to the purpose and the plan that he has for us, then we become like Daniel and his companions, faithful and good servants of the Lord. Now, at the end of three years, it says that Daniel and his companions were brought before the king. They were summoned by Nebuchadnezzar into what some history books call the presence. You know, I was reading back in the seven, some works that were written in the 1700s not long ago, and speaking of going into the, the court of the kings of England, uh, it was referred to as being in the presence. And I was thinking, how audacious is that? And, and, in, and one king was quoted as telling uh, uh, one person, you may depart the presence. And the same king later was quoted, you'd better leave the presence if you value your life. And so we see the, the correlations there between the presence uh, 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 that these kings imagined that they had with the very presence of God. Because God does call people, in, especially in the Old Testament, into and out of his presence. And in some cases, the presence of God could be lethal to those who weren't pure enough to exist in that presence. Like, like uh, Moses on Mount Sinai. There were boundaries around the mountain. And God told Moses to tell the people, anyone who comes across that line into this presence will die. So you can, you can imagine the audacity of a, of a mortal earthly king describing you know, being with them in the same room as being in the presence. So I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar had that level of pride. We'll find out later that he was a very prideful person. So they were summoned into the presence. But what the Babylonians did not know is that Daniel and his companions had been in the presence all along. For three years, they'd been in the presence of God. And so they had a three-year head start or advantage on those who were just now being summoned, summoned into the presence of this earthly king. And it says that, that the king communed with them, and same as before. For many of, of, of these uh, people who had been brought before the king, it was the first time that they'd ever communed with a king. But Daniel and his companions had been in commune with God and blessed by him for at least three years, if not more. And it's no wonder that we, when we look at our text that we see what the, uh, that the king learned that there were none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In fact, our text tells us that he found them to be better than the rest by a factor of ten. That simply illustrates a very simple point for us. When we serve the Lord, we will see our efforts blessed. And when God blesses our efforts, the world around us will see that as well. All of all will see, including us, everyone around us will see our Lord's work. They may not recognize it as such. Nebuchadnezzar didn't recognize the work and the hand of God in and upon Daniel and his companions, but he couldn't argue with the results. He knew it was better than the rest. And beloved, when God works in and through us, 
People may not realize it, but they can't argue with the results. And they'll see that the way that we live life, the way that we approach challenges and obstacles, the way that we support one another and remain true to what we believe is better than the rest. You think about it. You've been there. What, what brought you to the Lord? What led you to faith? Well, you had to come to the understanding that his, under, that his way was better. Always has been, always will be. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for 